Welcome to Ocean's Arena stage on this very special day as we celebrate together the very first Women in Maritime Day resolved by the IMO Assembly on its 32nd session. A very important day, a milestone for the maritime industry and acknowledging uh, the need for greater gender equality and how women are vital for sustainability of this industry, which will be celebrated on the 18th of May every year. Joining me in this very interesting discussion on trying to compile a to-do list for gender equality are some very distinguished panelists. I am Gina Panayotu, the founder of Oceans Arena and host of Oceans Arena Stage. And opening this session, I'm very humbled and honored to introduce as honorary guest and keynote speaker, Her Excellency Engineer Hesa El Malek, who is an advisor to the Minister of Maritime Transfer Affairs at UAE Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure, a true trailblazer in the maritime industry, especially in respect to female empowerment, both regionally and internationally. She has been serving the industry for 20 years in the Ministry 414, and she's the president of the Arab Women in Maritime Association. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for joining us today to open this session of Ocean's Arena Stage, a to-do list for gender equality. A warm welcome to all of you present here today. Firstly, it is an honor to speak in the Integral International Day of Women in Maritime on behalf of United Arab Emirates as a member of the IMO Executive Council. We are proud to have contributed toward the dedication of the International Day of Female in the Sector. As per the International Transport Work Federation, only 2% of the global maritime workforce is made up uh, of women. And according to 2021 Seafarer Workforce uh, report by BIMCO and the International Chamber of Shipping, women represent only 1.28% of the seafarer around the world. Although the number have been 45.8% increase since 2015, but the percentage is still quite low. We believe that gender diversity is extremely important to make optimal use on wide range of skills to drive progress of the sector. And according to the Harvard Business Review, frame with the women in top position are more profitable, more social responsible and provide better quality services. Therefore, women are essential for ensuring more secure future for the maritime industry, which is now become more reliant on advanced technology, automation, and AI. The IMO implementation of women empowering in maritime has paid a lot through the extensive discussion that have taken place throughout the entire industry. Not only has fostered a more welcoming environment for women to seeking maritime career, but it has also set agenda in motion to bridge the gender gap that has hovered over the industry since its inception. The many subdivisions of WISTA around the world have continued to thrive and increase awareness of important role that women play in the global shipping sector. With the digitalization as a new buzzword in the sector, there is more demand for brain power than physical which will now produce more opportunities for women work in the industry and offer them a better uh, prospects. Innovation and development is necessary for the advancement of any industry, which is why we believe in recreating young talent that will build a more diverse, adoptive, and digitally advanced sector. Over the past few years, the IMO have been worked hard to achieve a better representation for women in the industry and it's our role today is to support this effort. It is time for us to work together in cooperation with the private sector, shipping companies, academic institution, international association and other stakeholders to positively change the perception about the industry. We can achieve this by providing women with more opportunities to gain experience in maritime operation create awareness to inspire young females to build career in the industry and encourage companies to recreate more women uh, by recognizing their capabilities. As a result of all these efforts, I'm sure that we will be able to bridge the gender gap existing in the sector. 
and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for this uh, very inspiring keynote address. It's a pleasure to have had you with us and share your thoughts on this uh, very important subject, and especially in respect to the UAE region. And of course, without further ado, we'll move on to an amazing panel discussion with some extremely special uh, panelists who have been carefully se uh, selected to be with us today. I'm very excited this, uh, this gathering to celebrate the first IMO um, Women in Maritime Day is very special to me. And uh, I think we will have a very productive and insightful uh, discussion on the matter. A to-do list for gender equality, I'll introduce the panelists really, really briefly, and they can, of course, add on with their uh, with their bios. So uh, usually we do it ladies first, and we should be for IMO uh, Maritime Women in Maritime Day. But since uh, our only gentleman on the panel, who is a very passionate advocate of uh, gender equality, uh, is uh, the only one here representing the male gender, I will start with introducing Mr. Guy Platten the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. Uh, Guy is a qualified master mariner. He has held a number of senior positions, including Chief Executive of the UK Chamber of Shipping, Chief Executive of Caledonia Maritime Assets, and Director of Marine Operations for the Northern uh, Lighthouse Board. Uh, moving on is Sanjam Jugta, Gupta, who is the Maritime CEO founder and director of Sitara Shipping. Um, she has also been nominated the top 100 women in shipping by All About Shipping UK, executive board member of the World Maritime University, and very recently has also been appointed a global consultant for a project of the UN. She'll tell us a bit more about it, I guess, uh, as we move on. Uh, following on is Captain Radhika Menon, who is uh, a sailing captain with uh, Synergy Maritime, co-founder of the International Women's Seafarers Foundation, the first actually woman captain of Indian Merchant Navy, and the first woman to receive an award for exceptional bravery at sea in 2016 by the IMO. Her latest award was the Nari Shakti Award, uh, awarded by the president in India, if I'm not mistaken, but Captain Radhika would brief us in shortly. Uh, following on is Sue Terbilowski, who is a diversity and inclusion expert and speaker on the matter. She is the managing director of ImageLine, press officer of Worcester International. She co-chairs co the Maritime UK's Diversity Task Force and one of the three leaders of the EU, EU Maritime Women's Project. And she's also a member of Women in Logistics and Women in Transport. And Sofia Gostandopoulou, last but not least, of course, with the Global Head of Marketing and Events at Libya and the founder of the Greek International Women's Award. Sofia will brief us in a little bit more about that as we move on. And she's also a cultural and political advisor of the Euro-American Women Council and executive member of the Greek Soroptimist Union. Uh, so this is our incredible panel, and I start right with our questions. Um, I'll be sharing some figures. I know these are not the most recent ones, and WISTA, uh, in association with the IMO and ICS, if I'm not mistaken, will be releasing some updated figures soon. But if we look at them with what we have at hand, it says that the maritime sector, uh, out of the maritime sector, pro approximately 34% of the workforce are women. 2% which in, are in director roles. And when it comes to seafarers, the problem is even worse with only 2% of, of the more than 1.5 million seafarers globally being female. So we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion, but the uh, numbers remain worryingly lo low. So I would like from all of you to share your experience quite diverse on um, the regions and your backgrounds and why you believe this remains still the case. Maybe we'll start uh, with Guy on this one and uh, make the rounds. Uh, th thank you very much, Gina. Yeah, I think it is shocking that it's so low. Let, uh, let's, let's be honest, let's put it out there. It's, there's no excuse for it. There's, you know, you could try and look into the reasons behind it all, but really we, we, we need to look forward and, and we need to address this quite urgently as well. It's great there's so many leaders on this call as well, and that shows you, you know, that there's it's, there's no limit of talent to, to out there and, and you can get to the very top, but we need to actually get people in at the bottom to start with in order to, to get that. And I think that's where we're, we're missing. And I I, I think it, it, it all starts and be, you know, when, when, when young people start looking at their career options going forward, I do remember, speaking to some female cadets and we were analyzing why there was only a few female cadets and i was speaking to one young lady who said 
well, it, it starts, it, it, particularly in the, this is a, in the UK context, and it, it, there may have be parallels elsewhere in the world, but in the UK, a lot of people at the age of 14 then choose the more specialist subjects they're going to study to their first level of exams. So in the UK, it's something called GCSEs, and then you go on to the advanced exams and then on to university after that. And so they have to make these decisions at the age of 14, what they're going to, to, to go forward. And almost they're planning their career at that age. And very few women seem, well, very few is, is an increasing number, but it's still tasty few choose the STEM subjects, the science, technology, the, the maths type courses. And so then when they do want to make their decisions on their career, they haven't got that background, that ed educational background, which enables to happen. So it's something that we have to address, you know, particularly for seafaring at a much earlier age than perhaps we're doing. It's, it's too late once people are 18 years old, really. We need to go much further back to do that. I also think we need to, to change some of the uh, the culture of our industry as well. That needs to, that certainly, I mean, my, my daughter's a seafarer and, and the horror stories she's told me about her time, particularly during training, you know, as a father uh, was not particularly pleasant to hear. And that needs to change. And that's about you know training. That's about cultural uh, uh, diversity and also about just making sure people realise um, what is what is good practice and we've got a diversity toolkit coming out later on the year and some on the call have been part of that I know uh, which will hopefully encourage companies to to re-educate their their, their their seafarers and their employees a, a, about the whole issue of diversity so um, that's, a, that's a long answer really for you but you know I, I just think it's it, there is no there is no excuse for us to have two percent. This just you know we really have to up our game and to change that, particularly with decarbonisation coming on. The opportunities, the technological opportunities that are going to be there. Let's let's use this as an opportunity to change the way we uh, operate as a as an industry. Exactly, and uh, this is one of the reasons why I was saying I'm so ecstatic about this day because I believe days like this really raise that awareness and we're having these talks and we can really be taking things forward. Maybe since you gave such a, um, a focus on the seafaring aspect, I'll move on to Captain Radika who can obviously share from personal experiences on board what her thoughts are on the matter. Uh, good morning, yeah, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I've, I've been out at sea for past 31 years and still a sailing master. And uh, I, uh, along with two other girls uh, and a lot of female seafarers, we run International Women Seafarers Foundation. We have uh, uh, women sailor members worldwide. Uh, what I feel is with the IMO's effort of the, uh, from 2017, that is the SDGs to create awareness for uh, our field, that is seafaring uh, careers, that a uh, lot of contracting governments have accepted it and a uh, lot of changes have been initiated. And uh, world over, there is a huge uh, uh, change of wave. Uh, new uh, females are seeing this as a career option. Regarding uh, and now, uh, what I compa compare to what I, it was in 90s, where I took to seafaring, there were, uh, uh, the awareness was uh, very little. Probably if there was awareness, somebody would have come up much before me. So now uh, with IMO's effort, the awareness is that, now what we should think of uh, the participation has to improve. To improve the participation, the first thing, uh, as uh, uh, Captain Guy said, uh, the awareness. When I talk about awareness, I'm talking about uh, uh, what is the basic qualification required to get into seafaring career? What are the seafaring career options? And how, what exactly is expected of a, uh, a girl when she opts for a particular post on the ship in terms of work? And uh, what support we can provide them? This is what we do. Uh, we have tried out in India. Uh, Bangladesh and few other countries and uh, we uh, get good results because what, with a lot of awareness, there are females flowing into the stream, but they are not able to sustain because once they get on board and they come to know uh, they are in a socially isolated atmosphere and they have to put in so many hours of work, they are cut off from the family, then there comes a full stop. So uh, that, this is the wastage of training and a lot of other things. Second thing is what, like Captain Gay said, gender sensitization trainings. 
for the shore staff in the shipping offices as well as on the ship for both women and men has to take a uh, good momentum. Mm -hmm. It has to catch up. Now there are flaws uh, that uh, few girls uh, get uh, really depressed or drop out of their sailing careers because of uh, uh, these things. Like so, uh, and then there has to be policies. And there has to be defined, very co correctly defined procedures for tackling uh, problems uh, related to, like uh, when you put two genders in a socially uh, isolated atmosphere, when a girl is dealing with uh, people uh, of opposite gender from various backgrounds, various uh, mindsets and all that, what could come up? It's not a case. Well, so if you have uh, clear cut policy guidelines and procedures, how to tackle these problems. This gives security to the females uh, uh, opting for the uh, sea carrier. The uh, sense of security will draw more females into it. And strict compliance of these policies. Mm -hmm. If there is a policy to tackle sexual harassment, and if that says in this seven days time, an, an ICC committee to square up uh, the, this one, uh, the whatever sexual harassment or assault or what sort of complaint or bullying that has a stipulated time. So here in India, uh, our DG shipping uh, has come out with uh, uh, conducive uh, guidelines for creating conducive work atmospheres for uh, women on uh, board ships, uh, which uh, those guidelines are really tackling a lot of uh, these things. Yeah. So we po we have to improve uh, participation. Uh, if we work on these things, uh, we can expect a lot of a uh, lot of people coming into the stream. But I doubt really if uh, we'll have fifty percent women because women at some point of time have to take to show careers. Because like in uh, Asia, uh, in our country and all. So we we take up uh, we try we get married around 28 or so we have a baby at 30. In my times it was at 20s. So uh, when the baby comes, when you start a family, then you there is a discontinuity in the sailing career. So when this female goes ashore and she has a baby and she has to stay at home to stay stabilize her family for one or two or three years. Here we had a problem that shipping uh, companies were not taking them back, but a mail was taken back. Um, so uh, with a lot of reasoning, uh, and even our DG supports that uh, a female can be taken back on the same position. So when there is a job security and when there is a clear cut, uh, like a, a seafaring female will very well fit into shore uh, uh, job options. Mm -hmm. So if a ship employer says, like, after uh, this, if this lady wants to shift over uh, to shore in uh, second mate's rank, she can discontinue for some time, she can uh, be ashore or in a mate's or in a master. Like, the choice also uh, can be given. And now in India, what we see is, earlier for me, it was very difficult to get a job placement for a girl at a lower rank to shift the shore. Now, uh, almost all ship, ship owners are opting for uh, uh, second mates, fourth engineers and all. They have the slots there. Definitely. A lot, Thank of, you. a lot of work to be done there for sure going forward. And uh, which, But it's good to see that at least some things are changing. Um, I'll move on to uh, Sophia, who has a bit of a diverse background before I go to Sue and Sanjam, because I know both of them are like uh, very passionate about the policy aspect also. Um, Sophia, would you like to share your thoughts, uh, given also your background and the region in which you operate? You're on mute, so it would be very helpful if we could also hear your thoughts. Of course, thank you very much, Zina, for your kind invitation, first of all. I'm extremely happy to be part of this panel, especially because we have managed to gather a diverse spectrum of uh, panelists today. A few words about me. I'm the founder of the Greek International Women Awards, as you said, the GIWA, where through these awards, my team and I, we source, we empower, and we recognize Greek leading women in 14 different industries globally, including the shipping industry. 
Now, what does Jingwa does? Uh, by sharing the successful stories of these incredible women, we are trying to create an impact in regards to gender equality. These women's professional achievements can empower and inspire, and inspire even more women to break the glass ceiling, as we call it. What does this mean? To make them think outside the box, to encourage them to ask for a promotion, to ask for a pay rise, to basically follow the dreams. At the same time, my full-time job is at the International Banker Industry Association, where I work as a global head of the marketing and events. And at the moment, we have presence in the UK, Singapore, South Africa, and Greece. Here, I would like to share with you how extremely proud I am that 100% of our global workforce is women. Now, back to your question why the numbers are so low. Um, first of all, I feel like we haven't been talking enough about, about it. We have only started talking about equality and diversity the last 30 years. We need to bear in mind that we are trying to close a fundamental gap, this of the gender inequality, which has been in our culture and in our plant for over 10 centuries now. I think we are just at the beginning of scratching the surface of such an important human and humanitarian, obviously, uh, issue. Uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, before I joined the, the panel, let us look at the numbers, uh, projects that it will take more than one century to close the current gender gap in the countries, in every country. Therefore, in order to see radical changes in all sectors, I believe the public uh, bodies, along with the private initiatives, to go hand by hand and work on creating and implementing legislations and policies which give uh, advantage to the diversity, basically. Diversity is the only way for a company, for a business, or even for a whole country to grow and succeed. Now, to answer your question, why the numbers are still low in the shipping industry, Gina? I will give you the simple example on what is going on. For centuries, now men have been the kings of the sea. And now, what do we do? We are asking them, basically, to share their kingdom. Think about that. Because companies are still looking for managers and not for leaders, they are still looking for people with knowledge from the past and not for people with skills. Um, because in many countries, education for women is still limited. Uh, because the word mentoring is a luxury for some cultures. Or because the unbiased behavior needs to become part of our lives. Women, especially in the shipping industry, have proved they can work under very tough circumstances. And Captain just mentioned it. The seafarers are true heroes. So it is a matter of getting the opportunity. From my experience and through the, the, the Greek International Women Awards testimonies, I have observed that at least the Greek women have found difficulties in progressing in the shipping industry because either they don't get a children's support from the government or even from their families to develop their careers, or they have met a lot of sexist behaviors in their business environment. I'm going to close <laughs> with a positive note. I strongly believe that there is a shift to progress, and we have seen examples of women around the world thriving and leading ships, shipping companies, or being in decision-making positions. In terms of numbers, we are doing better. We have to take that into, into consideration. But in terms of substance, we have a long way. So we just need to keep up the hard work, empower each other, and train men, Dina. Our colleagues, our sons, our fathers, our, our husbands, our managers, to start trusting women more. Exactly. That's very, very valid points. Thank you so much, uh, Sophia, for sharing. Uh, Sue, would you like to go next? Thank you, Dina. I'm just going to build on all the other points, and I totally agree with them. But I think what we need to think about is two strategies. It's a completely different strategy for the seaside to the shoreside. 
and they're two different, I think, problems. So if you think about the seaside, as Sophia quite put it, it has got centuries and centuries of history of being a male-dominated sector and lots of ingrained um, conscious biases, and not even unconscious, there are conscious biases on there that we need to tackle. But the big thing is that we've been an industry that's kept ourselves really quite quiet. We haven't promoted ourselves as a sector or an industry. We know it because we're in the sector. You go into most schools anywhere in the world and they don't know it. They don't know what shipping is. They don't even know there is a career path possible. We keep talking to ourselves and the converted. We don't really get out and, under, and talk to the people. We have a fantastic opportunity and I call it the reset button. The world has worked out that shipping exists and that's predominantly through a couple of things that aren't the best things for shipping like the Ever Given when it blocked the Suez. We had prime time television for almost a month talking about shipping. We've now got with COVID and what's happening with China and the ports all being congested, people talking about shipping. If we don't catapult off of that and explain the other side about how valuable shipping is and what a great career it is, we're going to go back to where we were, is that nobody's going to know about shipping. And Princess Anne, I think, has a fantastic um, caption for this, is the world has sea blindness. It doesn't know what happens at sea. And I think what we need to think about is how we build on that, because you're not going to get the people Guy was talking about who makes the career decisions at 14. To even think of a, C, a career at sea, if it doesn't know it, the teachers don't know it, nobody knows it. And unless you come from a family where there is a seafarer, the chances are you would never, ever entertain it. So I think we've got that problem to address. We've also then got the problem to address of when people do have members in the family and they've experienced something bad at sea, they, the first thing they say, and I've spoken to loads of people, is whatever you do, don't have a career at sea. Um, so we need to show that the industry is now looking at an attack and realising there are some issues and how it's coping with it. And I think that is starting to happen. We are seeing that shift and we need to be proud and not hide behind the fact that they're not happening. Actually say they are happening, but this is what we're doing to address it. And we do care and we do value. And it's the same in many other sectors. So I think if you think about male dominated sectors, the ones that are really thriving, the ones that are honest and open, and that we, we say that we are tackling this, we are putting in anti-bullying, you know, anti -bullying, harassment policies, we're seriously doing this. I think we've got to empower the DPA more. They've got to be able to be able to do something about it if somebody does go to them with a problem and an issue, and they need to be further reinforced. I do think they should do helm training. I think we need to do some things within the industry as well. But the other side I want to talk about, which hasn't been spoken about, is shore side. And companies hide behind their um, gender split on the shore side. They factor in all the jobs that are historically always done by women, the receptionists, usually HR, usually marketing, usually all those uh, finance and accounting. And they say, we've got a good gender split in our company because they take all of those jobs. But when you go to the ship brokers side of things, when you go to the real hard maritime lawyer side of things and look at the stats, they're woefully short of the averages of all the countries, but they can mask behind it. So I think we need to, when we talk about diversity, we need to split what are maritime and shipping jobs and what are company jobs and what is the split in a company and what is the language and culture that you're using to recruit people into that industry? And I am sick and tired of seeing loads of jobs advertised in Lloyd's List, Trade Winds and various other publications that says, you must be a captain to apply for this job. You are then cutting out virtually everybody from applying that's a female. There are so few captains that can apply for that job. And why? When you look at the job, actually what you need is skills on Microsoft. You need to be a good analytical brain. You need to be a team player. Those aren't skills that are unique to a sea captain. So I think we need to look at different strategies for different solutions and also be honest and transparent. But we are improving. There, there is now a real culture shift. And as I say, we have a reset button. Now is the time as we start to get out of all that's happening to really think about how we recruit, what we recruit and who we want to recruit for. And we're getting to this later on, I think. But 
there is a sound business case for this as well. It makes more profit for companies. Exactly, exactly, most definitely. And of course, uh, last but not least, Sanjam, you've uh, brought about a wave of awareness uh, in India and beyond when it comes to this issue. So your thoughts uh, on this? Um, thank you so much, Gina. And actually, Sue has just, you know, he, she just ended on the perfect note about talking about the business case for diversity. And um, as a business owner myself, um, second generation in the family business under the name of Sitara Shipping, um, I know how important bottom lines is, right? That's really important. So while a lot of people say, oh, you know what? We believe diversity. We want to have more women because it's the good thing to do. No, it's the, there's, the, there's a business case behind it. And uh, in 2020, uh, during COVID, we got some funding from the Dutch consulate in Mumbai. And we, did, uh, we, we interviewed 104 Indian companies. And this is exactly what we researched. And while, of course, there was certain confidential data that they couldn't share with us, where we couldn't actually compare, but uh, from what interviews we did and the 104 companies we spoke to, we found that there was a very strong connection between greater levels of diversity to higher profitability, productivity, teamwork, and innovation. So I think um, if this is the case, and uh, business owners cannot be shy anymore. Ship owners cannot be shy from saying that we don't want to hire women because actually it's, it's more profitable. And I think that's where we need to really focus on. Uh, secondly, for me, I think it's important to also have more women leaders and Maritime Shio focuses on that because I think while it's important, as Sue said, to have women at all levels of the organizations, it's so important to have women leaders. And I'll give you one example of that. We had the first uh, CMD of the Shipping Corporation of India, Mrs. H.K. Joshi, and it was under her reign that on Women's Day, they came up with an all-woman crew on a coastal vessel. And I think it really was very, it took a woman to be at the helm, and she's a non-captain heading the Shipping Corporation of India. When she took over, I think there was so much of a criticism that she was not a marina. So as Sue said, some jobs you don't have to be a marina, and you shouldn't, it shouldn't be held against you. I'm a seafarer's daughter. And let me tell you, when I started my career, nobody told me that women could actually go to could go to sea. And, you know, it was never encouraged because it was considered so difficult. And that's one of the biggest regrets I have. And I have a lot of respect for all the women who sail. And Radhika, of course, is, uh, is an icon for us. And she's really paved the way. And having her and more role models like Radhika is so important. So yes, I agree with that awareness aspects. It's so important to put women out there and say, you know what, you can grow up to be a captain. And to all the little girls out there who are looking for role models, you're giving them an actual person they can relate to and say, I'm going to grow up and be another Radhika Menon. I'm going to be the captain of a ship. Now to achieve that, I know it's difficult and I've also handled a lot of cases of harassment. So what I think is so important is to have a zero tolerance towards harassment and there is there is no negotiation there you cannot say okay we let this go we will not let this go because there has to be a very strict zero tolerance policy most of the cases that i've handled where girls have been harassed and when they, most often they don't complain because they're scared of losing jobs and when they do end up complaining there's an inquiry that sits and in so many cases I've seen, uh, the outcome of the inquiry is simply that the girl wasn't good in her work and that she's making excuses. And I'm not passing judgment on whether this is true or not, but it's often her work ethic that gets questioned. Mm -hmm. And she's alone on, and she has no proof to make her case. Um, I think this also stems from the behavioral insight. That it's important to have awareness. And you have to remember that a lot of people who go to sea have probably the way, why they are behaving towards women on board is that they have never seen a woman in an operational role. The, the only role that they have seen growing up is seeing a woman in the kitchen at home and it's considered a woman's job. So seeing that they are bad, somebody's black or bad or good, no one's black or white. They have, there's a, there's a, there's a reason they are behaving it because they've never seen it. But what we can do is you know, give that awareness, give that sensitization training. There has to be a mandatory sensitization training. We're looking at so many mandatory trainings that seafarers have to go up. They have to update themselves, you know, for everything. Why don't they have to update themselves on getting sensitization training? This is so important. And if this is done, I believe the cases would reduce drastically. We have to tell them that this is not acceptable and really have a zero tolerance case. Um, 
Also, I feel one more aspect needs to be looked at. And as Radhika said, we need to bridge the gap between ship to shore. So when women want to leave careers at sea and when they want to come on shore, we need to make sure that they are accommodated well. And there's such a high demand on women who are operationally technically qualified in the port sector, in the logistics sector, in the supply chain sector. So I think if uh, everybody stops working in silos, everybody wants to do great work. And I think domestically, nationally, internationally, there are a lot of organizations who are doing good work. But I think it's important to remember at one point, we need to stop working in silos, join hands and work together because the goal is the same. And unless we all can kind of put all our strengths together, it's then we can really drive the big change. Exactly, so true. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjam. I think quite a few uh, things already are going on that to-do list. Um, being a bit mindful of the time because you've also got, got so uh, such an important input to share. And I know Guy has to leave uh, soon. I'm going to combine the two last questions and do the rounds and I'll start with Guy. So um, the second two points I wanted to bring forward for your input. So studies show that in, and you have touched upon this, of course, that if every country matched the gender equality progress of the faster moving nations, the world GDP would rise by some 12 billion. So if you had to make the business commercial case for diversity in our industry, what would be your key message or opening line? And then on a second level and the theme of this uh, today's panel, in order to truly shift those dynamics, we need actionable targets. So if you were given the magic abilities to action steps and fix this problem from A to Z, uh, whether it's achieving gender equality on board or offshore, what would be the top three things you would put on that to-do list? Uh, Guy. <laughs> I think diversity means profit. That's the, that's the first thing I'd say. Perhaps that's the, the catchphrase to use. Yes. If I was to, you know, I'll be brief. Um, uh, if we to set targets. Uh, why not start at the top? Let's let's commit to having fifty percent of our boards uh, uh, um, uh, women and men. So, and the study after study has shown that a gender diverse board is far more profitable, and makes far better decisions. Mm -hmm. So, it's not all women. It's not all men. It's having that that balance. So, uh, I think that that would be the target I would set. And once you've done that. I think the rest of it floats down as a result of that because you've got those other decisions being made. So you start at the top and then you cascade that down. Thank you very much, Guy. I think that's a very uh, actionable point and should should ideally not, not be so difficult to achieve, but I don't know why we're still unfortunately having these discussions. Um, Sue, would you like to go next on this? Thank you, Gina. I think there's a couple of things. One that I would say is my campaign and what I firmly believe in is the 100%. A business can never know 100% they've got the right person for the job if they only go to 49% of the population. They cannot say that they have made the best decision for that company. So it starts right at recruitment and making sure there are recruitment policies in the company that is fair and open. And that looks at language they use in the adverts, the way they project their company for people to apply. And then the help, you know, I always remember my first job when I went to the BBC, I sat in a boardroom with 15 men and me as a young person sitting the other side. It was so daunting to think about the environment and how you're projecting yourselves. So I would say the 100% right at the beginning what, and right the way through the company, if you are recruiting, you should have an equal pool at the beginning. I'm not saying you have to recruit a woman, but what I'm saying is if you have an equal and fair pool, then the percentages will go up because it's, if you're only talking 49% of the population, you're only gonna get 49% of the population going through. So that's something I'm really passionate about. The other thing is, is I think we need to look at and have some targets that we all get behind and Guy through the International Chamber of Shipping has started to produce some stats in their, um, in their um, publication that they brought out. And I think we need to all get behind Guy and his stats because unless we all universally get through behind something, we are not going to be able to um, change the world because we are not silos. One country cannot affect everything. It has to be a global initiative. So I think we need to back Guy and his stats. I think we then need to make culture changes within ourselves to be prouder of what we are and who we are in maritime and not behind 
and hide and put ourselves down. So I think we need to stress the business case about having the best person for the job. I think we need to st stress that we are going to make a change in the industry and all get behind it. And I think what we need to reach is the people that aren't listening to this call and everybody else in our sector that hide behind talking and not doing and then actually hold them to account. And we need more allies. We need people like Guy in high ranking positions saying what they're saying. Exactly, very valid points. And uh, ooh, I really hope that we'll be able to give uh, some further exposure outside of the industry with this panel. So we'll do our best to promote it in every way possible. Uh, moving on to Captain Radrika, maybe would you like to share your thoughts on uh, the opening line for the business case on diversity and uh, yeah, uh, the actionable? Uh, what I would speak purely on uh, in view of seafaring career, okay? So out of three, uh, I'm not an economist to comment on the GDP rise, but I would definitely say uh, three jobs means uh, competence. If a man can do it and a woman can do, uh, surely do it because the amount of training and the knowledge shared and the competence level, it is... Uh, uh, just that uh, uh, the competence ma matters in taking up vessel from A to B and conducting business. Coming over to the second side of your question, as I have stated, it is awareness that is uh, giving out information regarding all aspects of uh, uh, seafaring and uh, our International Women Seafarers Foundation. We work with them when they are on board and I give them ideas to how to stay, stay out of trouble. Uh, like initially itself, then policies and procedure for handling uh, uh, harassment and other sorts of women-related issues. And uh, the uh, carrot would be if you give uh, a candidate, female candidate, a clear uh, career path progression where she can where she can visualize uh, take the correct decision where where she would land up after so many years of. C career, or if, uh, or if uh, she uh, comes to the show, within how many years time gap she can adapt back to sail. That's all from. Thank you very much, uh, Captain Radhika, for your uh, input. Sanjam, would you like to share your thoughts on that opening line key message and the three action yeah. for target? Yes, so uh, the first thing uh, is that we, we need to make sure we have the gentlemen on board because currently they are the gatekeepers of power and they are the ones who can really help us make the change. Um, women want to be there, they want to succeed. And I think unless we take them, the gentlemen along with us, they, they have to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think is to make diversity a strategic goal for the company. It should be on every company's website and we should make women in, in leadership should be one of the strategic goals of the company. Um, and finally, I know this is very challenging, but I also feel that as company declare financial results, they should be also be declaring, you know, uh, diversity statistics in their, you know, the public limited companies, those who are, who are kind of bound to declare, they must voluntarily or they must declare that, whether it's made mandatory. Because I think it's only when those numbers are out there, when we realize that that's important to also declare that it would be taken as seriously. And then it's also uh, important because we'll be able to tap the, get more data. So data is important, right? If we have more declarations, we'll be able to see profits of the company and we can compare them with a high level of diversity. And I think that would be a win-win for everyone. But I don't know how far we are from that, but that is on my wish list. <laughs> Most definitely, a beautiful wish list, uh, actually, as all of the points made today. Um, and Sophia, your thoughts on uh, that opening line to convince this industry on the business case and the, your three uh, things for the, your wish list? Yes, uh, uh, in my campaign, I would include uh, gender, race and national equality, but to focus uh, uh, on the achievement of gender equality, I would start my campaign with men's characteristics are not the norm. This fact is that the, the tendency is to consider male characteristics are the norm, and those of women as a variation of the norm. The shipping industry will need to be based 
on a redefinition of the rights and responsibilities of women and men in all spheres of the business, from the seafarers to the decision-making positions to the trading and working uh, or the legal positions. It also underscores that gender equality is concerned not only with the roles and responsibility, but also with the relationships between men and women. I think that men need to trust and rely on women more. And of course, women need to continue working hard and asking for the business. Within the context of population, gender equality is, is, is critical because it will enable women and men to make decisions uh, to make decisions that um, are, are, um, are uh, valuable for the business. Um, here I would like to share some success stories uh, of some exceptional women who have made the difference uh, in the shipping industry, not only in Greece and Cyprus, but uh, globally. Just to understand that women are not lacking anything but opportunities. Uh, Melina Travlos, uh, I believe everybody knows about her, was elected uh, at the Hellenic Ship Owners Association this year and is the first uh, woman president in uh, 105 years of history. Uh, Angeliki Frango, leading the, the Navio shipping group with a fleet of 181 ships, or Maria Angelicusi, controlling Marin's uh, 140 uh, ship fleet. So yes, I strongly believe that equality not only can rise uh, the gross domestic product, uh, as you have uh, suggested, Gina, by 12 billion, uh, but even more uh, in every industry and uh, every country. Now, my three to-do list. We we'll start with uh, I would start with the first uh, and most important uh, aspect for me. It's to invest in education educate both men and women about gender equality and especially the younger generations since they are more sensitive to diversity issues and we will see a completely different business generation coming up. Also, educate companies from startups to uh, well-established business in order to implement ESG policies and learn how to offer the right environment to their employees to make them feel that their, 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 their contribution is respected and acknowledged. I also believe that the business needs to work a bit on uh, the reverse psychology. So how, how does it work? We need, the business needs to get feedback from the employees so they understand the real challenges they face and in order to improve the conditions of their business environment. Um, the second uh, thing I would do is I would create, uh, and I, I'm going to echo my panelists, I would create a solid database platform for each country to measure corporate diversity. Um, this platform will attract solid data from every industry in order to get accurate results for the progress of diversity. Uh, diversity, equality, and obviously that will increase transparency. Unfortunately, at the moment we are still lacking of accurate data. And the third thing, I would say that women should not stop fighting for their rights until we achieve our goal. Uh, which, why is that? Equal opportunities for all. I strongly believe in the saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. And together we can achieve everything. We need to be united, support each other, empower each other, and ask for the business. You know what? By creating circles of trust and mentorship, we actually build up each other's confidence. And this is what you do, Gina, through your platform. You're working hard for the benefit of your generation. So you're an inspiration for many and for us, and I would like to congratulate you on that. This panel was overwhelming enough and the excitement, so you just made it a little bit more. Thank you very much, um, Sophia, for that input. This has been such an amazing discussion and a lot of points are coming out there on obviously data and policy and having um, the success stories being shared, a collaboration, of course. 
and having men on board. And this is why I was truly grateful for Guy for taking the time to be here and acknowledging this as a priority to somebody to be advocating uh, on that level and on our behalf, which is absolutely amazing. We've got just a few more minutes. I don't know if you would like to share like a final thought before we wrap up. And I thank you for being here today. Um, Guy, just so I know you have to go very, very soon. Yeah, thank you, Jean, and thank you to my fellow panelists as well. I think it's been a really, really insightful discussion. I think uh, we're just scratching the surface of what could be a much deeper conversation, if we're honest. But I think it always fills me with hope that people come forward with with practical and progressive uh, solutions, which we now need to put in practice. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Gina, for convening this. Thank you very much, uh, Guy uh, Sanjam. I would like to say that let the industry unleash the power of you know half the workforce you're missing. So let's unleash that power together and it's for the benefit of the industry. Thank you, Gina, for this amazing panel. Thank you, Sanjam. Sue? I think what we need to concentrate on is things that we can influence and therefore looking at the maritime industry, I think we should all be campaigning that there's a change to STCW basic training and that diversity and working and you just say that sort of taking out the gender biases in the industry is part of that training i think then taking that forward also helm diversity and inclusion should be completely like a golden thread through the whole training i think we need to look at it and rewrite it i also think dpas should be mandatory to take helm training and then when it comes to the dpa i think they should have a legal accountability to take the appropriate actions on sexual harassment, bullying and discrimination, and that there should be a legal obligation on them to actually make sure that something happens because unless we change that culture and empower them to do their job properly, we're not gonna get the changes we want. So those are three things I think we can do now within our industry to make a big change. Definitely, thank you so much, uh, Sue, for that input, very concrete advice. Uh, Captain Radhika. Uh, thank you, Gina, for giving me this wonderful platform that I've been very uh, fortunate uh, for uh, being here listening to excellent ideas regarding diversity. Uh, what I would like to conclude is uh, whatever I said in the initial that only, so I don't want to repeat it. Um, I would thank all the panelists for the wonderful ideas and thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, Captain Radhika. And of course, last but not least, Sophia, and we'll uh, call it a day. I think we are all privileged being uh, at this amazing industry. Uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, us uh, and how to communicate to the outside world how we can together make it even greater uh, by gender equality, by inclusion and by diversity. Thank you very much, Gina, for this platform. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. You're so inspiring. And every time I have discussions with you, it just gives me more energy and enthusiasm to keep working to make our industry a, a better place and brand it better. So joining me, I am Gina Panayos, the founder of Oceans Arena, hosting uh, the Oceans Arena stage. And joining me today uh, was uh, Guy Platten, of course, the ICS Secretary General, Sanjam Gupta, who is the founder of Maritime C uh, CEO, uh, Sue Tabuloski, who is the Managing Director of ImageLine, Sofia Kostandogulu, who is the Global uh, Marketing and Events at uh, IBIA, and of course, the founder of Giva, and Captain Radhika Menon, who is a sailing captain, uh, at Synergy uh, Ship Management and many more uh, other astonishing things. You will be receiving their bios also in the invite with full details. Thank you to everybody for he being here today. And of course, last but not least, I would like to thank the, our keynote speaker, uh, Her Excellency Hesal Malek uh, from the Ministry of uh, Transport, of Energy and Transport um, at the UA in the UAE. And uh, of course, thank all of our supporters, the International Chamber of Shipping, of course, the Young Ship UAE, Maritime CEO, Wista UK, and the strategic media partner, Marasi News, and sponsors of this panel, uh, which are ABS, Sea Horizon Offshore Marine Services, Zenith Marine Services, Watson Farley Williams, and Mubarak Marine. 
thank you once again to everybody for this amazing panel and to everybody for joining and to the IMO for acknowledging this day uh, in 2022, finally. Thank you.